Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. My name is Darren Morgan, for all those of you who have not met me yet, and uh, I'm the nursery manager here at Chenards, and today we're going to talk about uh, garden plants and planting for pollinators. Um, and, you know, we live in an area where we have a really broad diversity of pollinators. A lot of them you're familiar with, some of them you probably aren't, and we need to do kind of a variety of different plants and plantings to encourage a diverse and healthy uh, pollinator population. We can't rely exclusively on our uh, introduced honeybees to pollinate everything. We have um, a lot of native bees, both bumblebees, which are colonial bees like, uh, like, uh, like honeybees, and also um, a whole batch, a couple of hundred species of solitary bees, leafcutter bees and mason bees and the like. Um, of course, butterflies and moths do some pollination work as well. Hummingbirds uh, have a pollination benefit. There are some unusual members uh, of, the, of the pollinator group. Um, a number of beetles, flies, particularly hoverflies, and even a few wasps participate in pollination activities to one degree or another, though seldom to the degree that, that the various bees do. So and when we're talking about encouraging pop pollinator habitat and pollinator populations, we're going to be looking at plants that attract um, as many as possible of those different types of pollinators. So pollinators as a group, they like all organisms, they have their specific needs. Pollinators need nectar as an energy source. This is for the vast majority of them, this is what they're visiting the flowers for. Um, so these flowers are producing all this nectar to attract these insects, which these insects then get contact with the pollen and move the pollen from plant to plant doing the pollination work. So this is immediate food resources for the insects that are feeding, um, car carbohydrates, but also micronutrients, vitamins and minerals. Um, in the case of bees, this is also food storage for, for, uh, for maintaining colony size and, and rearing young. Uh, so this is what honey is made out of, is the nectar out of the flowers. Pollen is also a critical resource for, uh, for many pollinators, in particular for the various bees. Um, honeybees and bumblebees use nectar and store nectar, but they store more and use more pollen in the course of brood rearing. Uh, this is their protein source, as well as some fats and, and amino acids. Some of our minor pollinators also make eff effective use of pollen as a food source. Flies and beetles are not visiting for nectar for the most part. Most of your flies and beetles are, that are doing any pollination work at all are pollen feeders. Um, so they're eating pollen and they're transferring um, extra um, but accidentally in the course of their feeding processes. In addition to the nectar resource uh, for uh, butterflies, um, they really need specific plants that are larval host plants. So butterfly and moth um, babies are caterpillars. Caterpillars eat the leaves of various plants. Um, the number of uh, butterflies and a good number of moths are fairly broad feeders. They'll feed across a wide range of plant types. Other butterflies in particular are very, very host specific. Um, the monarch is the example that people know best. They're, they are uh, milkweed uh, larval feeders. This is, this is the only thing they'll lay eggs on is milkweed plants run out of milkweed plants in the area, you run out of monarch population. So some of them are really selective, others much less so, but we do need to make sure we're providing the course of planting for pollinators, food resources for the larval stage as well. So what makes good plants for pollinators? Well, um, flowers that are, that are accessible and that they will actually read or register and recognize as a food resource. And so there's a few criteria in the flowers of plants that indicate for these pollinators where to find the nectar and to draw them into that nectary, that nectar resource of the flower in a way that collects pollen on them so they can transfer the pollen to other flowers. So shape is one of the big dominant um, characteristics of, uh, of pollinator uh, attracting plants. So flower shape matters and with a little experience, you can look at a, at a plant in flower and get a pretty good idea on who is probably doing the pollination work on it. So um, long tubular flowers are a classic example of, uh, of hummingbird fl uh, flowers, and broad disc-shaped flowers are more typical of butterflies and bees. So the shape of the flower 
controls the access to the nectary, uh, to the nectar reserve. And this is what really de de determines what's getting, even if other insects are feeding on it, determines who's doing the pollination of it. Color matters, um, and more so for some than others. Um, and we'll talk about it a couple of slides down the way, but bees see things different from the way butterflies see things, who see things uh, even substantially different from uh, the way hummingbirds perceive color. Uh, and so if you plant completely the wrong color of plants, you may miss out an entire group of pollinators simply because they're not, their eyes aren't built to register that color as a food resource. And then scent. Um, scent matters for pollinators, um, some. So hummingbirds and butterflies don't really respond too much to scent, but some of the other pollinators do. And so you can see some of these criteria illustrated here. Uh, flower shape. Open flowers with ready access to nectaries and either symmetrical, so there's their mirror image side to side, or as in the case of the of the uh, the Gaillardia up here, the, the coneflower up on top, um, radial symmetry, where all where it's got symmetrical outlines um, all the way around the flower. This is a real typical structure of plants that are pollinated by bees, um, because there's ready access to the nectaries, and there are guidelines showing them into the nectary, and the pollen is on the course to that nectary. So they're getting the pollen um, either collecting it intentionally in case of hunting bees, but more, more commonly getting it on their body hairs and transferring it when they visit the next flower. The deeply recessed nectaries in tubular flowers, um, in, there are certain butterflies and moths that will feed on those, um, but a lot of those are hummingbird pollinated, at least uh, in the Americas. That's not necessarily true worldwide. Um, so long tubular flowers like this have the nectary way back at the, at the base of the flower and the pollen producing parts of the, of the flower are near the entrance. And so the pollen is getting on the hummingbird head uh, or in some cases the moth head as they're sticking their tongues down in the flower to get the nectar. Butterflies will also feed a lot on radial symmetrical flowers like cone flowers. Um, they love clustered flowers, flowers where they're either a single flower where there's multiple nectaries, like in the case of the radial array of the aster flowers, uh, or clustered flowers like the head on the, uh, on the onion family, the allium flowers. And so butterflies tend to, for the most part, land and then walk from flower to flower, sticking their tongues down in each individual floret and, and finding the nectary in there. And they're often transferring pollen on their feet in the course of their, uh, of their, of their feeding process. So um, these are the shapes, and I say you can, with a little experience, you can get a pretty good idea of who's pollinating what by the, by the markings, the color, and the shape of the flower. Colors uh, matter the most really to bees. So bees don't see red well. Uh, it's not that they will never feed on red plants because there are other indicators they sometimes use, but white and blue and yellow are the dominant colors of, of bee pollinated plants. These are the colors they see the best. Butterflies uh, also perceive UV and UV reflection, and you will see them quite a bit on white flowers often because of that reason. Uh, but other than that, they really prefer very vivid colors, pinks, reds, uh, bright purples, um, as you see in the middle picture there with, the, with that uh, cluster flowered allium, um, that's an ideal color range for attracting butterflies. Hummingbirds also really like very vivid colors. And again, they will visit an array of flowers from time to time, but they really like reds and oranges and really bright, intense purples as well. Bees are the challenging one, um, but they do find food in other ways besides color. And one of the keys for bees is scent. Bees really recognize the scent of daytime flowering, daytime scented flowering plants. Um, so most plants that have a distinctively what we would class as a floral scent or a sweet scent are bee pollinated. Um, hummingbirds and uh, butterflies mostly don't seem to indicate much off of scent. Um, they don't seem to perceive it very well and it's not a high criteria. Many moths, but not all moths, do perceive scent very well, particularly nocturnal moths. Um, and so the night scented flowers like Nicotianas are typical of moth pollinated flowers. Now, beetles and flies, um, to the extent that they register on this at all, um, often are um, putrid uh, scents or musky scents. 
the musky scent of privet and boxwood attracts flies. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the rotting scent of, uh, the, the, the rotting meat scent that's very, very faint of things like uh, wild ginger uh, attracts certain beetles. Um, so typically musky scents are occasionally even less pleasant scents than that. Uh, and these are, again, mostly pollen feeders at that stage. So when we're trying to feed pollinators, different pollinators are active over different seasons. Some of them require feed over the entire season. Um, typically uh, bumblebees, honeybees um, are very long season feeders. Honeybees are actually the longest of any of our pollinators. And of course, honeybees are not native here, but we brought them over and we brought a lot of the plants they feed on over as well, a lot of our crop plants. Um, but in the Pacific Northwest, honeybees will fly even in January, we get a couple of warm days and they'll be out trying to forage and find resources. Um, so they forage literally all year round um, during daylight hours to some extent. Bumblebees a little less so. They are a colonial bee like a honeybee, so they have separate case. They build up res resources uh, and they have um, sterile workers. So um, the queens come out early and uh, find resources and, and get their colony going. And as, as resources pick up, they, they hatch out more and more workers until they get enough population to develop um, new reproductive cases, new, uh, new drones and queens. Um, so they're active individually as queens and as a colony for a long period over the season. They actually start ramping up earlier than the honeybees do. And uh, different species of bumblebee have slightly different operational periods, but they're active most of the, of the spring and summer, uh, a big chunk of the year. Um, hummingbirds forage a tremendous period of time. We have migratory hummingbirds in Western Oregon and we have resident, year round resident hummingbirds in Western Oregon. And our migratories are already back for the season. They come in about the time red flowering current and uh, mahonia start blooming uh, out in the wild. That's one of those are their key plants that they're coming back for. Um, and they're active clear through the summer and into the, into the early fall before they migrate south. Our resident hummers, our annas, are literally here year round. And you see in the little, uh, little picture on the top there, and Anna's uh, feeding on a winter blooming camellia, and that's a that's a December picture, uh, and that's real typical. We see uh, we see Anna's year round, and having some resource for them in that period when there's not much available uh, is very important for maintaining uh, the population. Our solitary bees are a little different. Individual varieties or species of solitary bees have pretty distinct windows of time. Uh, you know, your blue orchard mason bee is maybe the end of March through maybe the end of May, and that's it. The rest of their lifespan is in eggs and larvae as, as effectively dormant. Um, but in aggregate, they do cover the entire range of flowering season, typically declining in the late summer and fall as we run out of flower resources for them. Our natural biota doesn't, our natural botany doesn't really flower much that late. Um, so we have a, a series of different solitary bees at different periods of time and having adequate food resources for them in their active seasons is, is very important. So when we're talking about planting for pollinators, um, we're trying to encourage uh, the use of plants that are, first of all, attractive and easy to grow landscape plants. Uh, because if it's a real hassle to grow or it looks ugly, you really don't care about it that much in, the, in terms of the ornamental, uh, uh, you know, ornamental landscapes. So attractive and easy landscape plants is an important criteria when we're selecting pollinator plants. When at all possible, we're trying to uh, pick plants that have attraction to a very large range of multiple types of pollinators so that we can get more bang for our buck for the amount of space we're dedicating to plants. So plants that attract both bees and butterflies and are possibly also a larval food source for butterflies are a good example of multiple pollinator plants. Ideally, we want to get plants that bloom for a long period of time or alternatively, that bloom during periods of time when not much else is blooming to support the, the off-season health of, uh, of number of pollinators. So um, plants in the tree world that, that bloom more than four or five weeks are kind of unusual. Um, there are shrubs that bloom longer. There are a lot of perennials that bloom longer. And then of course, annuals fill in, can fill in the, the gaps there. Um, generally, the off seasons are the toughest thing to match up in terms of pollinator health. So uh, the winter blooming for our winter resident uh, um, annas, 
the early spring blooming to get your your honeybee populations up and burgeoning before they run out of resources that they've stored. Uh, the late summer and fall blooming material that is none of our natural flowers are doing and can support a diverse group of, of pollinators in that uh, in that off season. Last criteria. Uh, also, we obviously, we ought to, uh, plants that provide a lot of resources, both nectar and pollen are important, and in decent volumes. We would think this is like an obvious thing, um, but there are whole books on the topic of, of garden plants that provide adequate amounts of nectar versus adequate amounts of pollen or provide both. And a goodly number of uh, intensively hybridized plants really don't provide much resources at all. Forsythia right now is a classic example. Um, a beautiful flower, lots of flowers, there's no nectar in there and, and very limited pollen. So um, it's a, almost a void resource in terms of pollinators. Um, last criteria we select for, and it's not a, 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 a make or break criteria, but it's good if we can include lots of native plants in pollinator habitat, because um, obviously we mentioned you know, hun the honeybees are introduced, but the rest of our native pollinators co-evolved with specific groups of plants. And so they recognize them readily as food resources. They prefer them as food resources. Um, so we can get more bang for our pollinator buck if we are using natives where it is possible and practical to do so. So we're gonna go through uh, groupings of trees, groupings of shrubs, groups of perennials. And we'll talk a little bit about the end about how to integrate some of this information. Um, and at that point, then I'll open up to verbal questions. But in the meantime, if you have any follow up questions uh, that are relevant to what we're talking about at the moment, uh, you can put questions in chat and I'll catch them as I go through. So trees, some top pollinator trees, um, maples, huge volume of resource and early in the season for almost all maple species. Seven suns, it's a little, uh, Hepticodium is the Latin on that one. It's a little tree that uh, is not very well known, but is a, is a great bloomer in the late summer, uh, providing some very valuable resources in an off season. Golden rain tree, um, can be a little bit of a mess in a small uh, urban type landscape, but uh, has a huge volume of both nectar and pollen available in the, in the spring. All the fruit trees and their ornamental relatives, uh, major bee trees, uh, very widely used. Willows, another early flowering resource. And lindens, if you ever spend any time around, around linden trees, they're in uh, late spring or early summer, mostly early summer bloomer here. Uh, when your when linden trees are in bloom, you may not actually see the flowers. The flowers are relatively small and concealed. Um, but you'll notice the scent um, if you're driving, uh, dry, driving down, uh, down Walnut Boulevard in, in the early summer and all the linden trees planted on, the, on those banks up above the road are in bloom, you can smell them even in your car going by. They're that strongly scented. But the key thing about linden trees is when you um, walk under them in, in their bloom season, you will, you will hear a buzz 100 yards away from the tree sometimes. They're completely inundated with bees. They're a huge volume of, of nectar and pollen resource, uh, and the bees make very wide use of them. So maples, um, lots of pollen, lots of nectar, and this is often our first major nectar flow in the Pacific Northwest. So maple trees are, if you're running around town, uh, they're blooming now. They're blooming typically in March. Um, and so there's a huge nectar flow, and this is what often builds up uh, bee pop populations. Um, besides being an excellent pollen and nectar resource for bees, they are a larval uh, food resource for a number of caterpillars and can be a, a benefit in that way. Um, the volumetrics of, uh, of maple is hard, hard to overstate. Uh, the, the sheer volume of nectar and pollen available is tremendous. Um, and this is why they're such a valuable resource. This can be true of our big native big leaf maples, as you see in the picture with the very long pendant flower cluster, but it's just as true of some of the smaller ornamentals, uh, including Japanese maples have a, have a fair amount of nectar and, and pollen resource and don't take up quite as much space. This is seven suns, Hepticodium myconioides. Um, typical bloom season for seven suns is August into September, matches up about with crepe myrtle in terms of blooming season. Um, very pleasant little tree, about 15 feet tall, can be grown as a large shrub or a small tree. 
The flowers are mildly sweetly scented and we see uh, a tremendous array of pollinators on them in bloom. We do see some butterflies on them, we see a lot of hoverflies on them, but we see tremendous volumes again of bees on them. Um, so uh, good diversity um, and, and volumetrically substantial amounts of, of production. So golden rain, yellow flowers in the summer, um, and it, it tends to bloom in just about the time all of our traditional spring blooming trees and shrubs are finishing up. So we, it, it extends that available nectar and pollen resources. Um, again, it is widely used by many different types of pollinators, but primarily by bees. And uh, like the linden trees, you will see tons and tons of bees on an individual tree. It's a great ornamental with, uh, with a lot of landscape value. The yellow flowers, um, kind of an unusual color for, for flowering trees this far north. And after the flowers, they set these, uh, these Chinese lantern type paper pods that can be attractive in their own right and that persist through the summer and into the fall. Um, the big limit to them uh, from a landscape standpoint is they're kind of shallow rooted with a tendency to sucker a little bit. So if you've got space for them and you can put them out where they can be, be what they are, they're great. If you try to put them in a small, uh, small urban yard, they're sometimes a bit of a nuisance in that regard. Fruit trees. So don't assume that because it's a, a sterile or non-fruit producing tree that it doesn't have pollinator value. Even the flowering fruit trees uh, are good for pollinators. Of course, the, the uh, production fruit trees are, are widely pollinated by bees. They bring in bees commercially, intentionally to pollinate the orchards. The fruit trees as a group cover a fairly long season of bloom in the spring. Um, and the earliest blooming ones are blooming in early March and cycling all the way through, um, through May on the latest blooming, particularly in the ornamental group. Most of them, besides being uh, nectary and, and pollen resources for pollinators, are larval food sources. It is important when you're working with the uh, ornamental versions of these that you um, select for open flowered types. The really showy, very fluffy double flowered types the, like Quanzan flowering cherry that has all the ruffles inside the flower, the multiple rows of petals filling up the whole center of the flower, do not completely eliminate pollinator access but substantially limit pollinator access. So these double flowered, this applies to perennials and shrubs as well. The more they've doubled up all those extra petals in the center for show, the less value that plant has as a pollinator resource because there's fewer and fewer pollinators that can actually reach it. So we're talking about the uh, fruit trees, of course, we're talking about, of course, all the major fruit trees, apples, uh, cherries, uh, plums, apricots, all of that. Um, ornamentals expand that a, a bit uh, with, with later blooming varieties and the crab apple group, which are excellent pollinator resources. Willows. Um, there are tree willows and there are shrub willows, so quite a wide uh, variety. Um, our native willows are large shrubs to very small trees for the most part, uh, typically something in that 15 to 20 foot range, tall and wide but not single trunked. The um, tree forms typically have a less dramatic bloom, but they are still decent pollinator resources. The shrub forms, however, produce decent amounts of nectar and huge amounts of pollen. Different willows have different bloom times and the early ones started blooming uh, back in as early as late February and many of them are blooming now and they will continue through the mid spring. Most of them are pretty well done blooming by the time we hit the, the main spring, you know, late spring, early summer cycle in May and June. Um, they are beyond their pollen and nectar resources. They are tremendously valuable uh, larval host plants for quite a variety of butterflies and moths. Uh, a, a large number of species use them for, for uh, caterpillar host. Mentioned the lindens early. Summer bloom right at the, uh, the end of the, the main flowering season, the beginning of the dearth period again. Um, lindens are pretty substantial uh, trees for the most part. These are not small trees. They, they fall into the shade tree rather than the small ornamental tree uh, category. Um, a couple of words about linden. We love the bee attraction to them, but not all lindens are created equal and certain species of linden may exhibit mild degrees of toxicity to, to some types of bee. Um, it's been variable and they are studying that, but it's, uh, that is something you want to be a little careful of. Um, with the silver lindens, 
Uh, they, can, they can potentially be slightly toxic. The other thing about lindens is they draw a lot of leaf feeding insects like aphids. And so when you put them in an ornamental situation, you may get a fair amount of drippiness off of the leaves, sticky drippies that, that coat your car and anything else that's parked under the tree in the summer. Um, so often people who have lindens resort to using systemic insecticides to treat those aphid problems. Uh, but of course, this is extremely damaging to, uh, to bees that are feeding on those trees. So be aware when you're looking at linden that you want to get the right types of lindens and that you are intentionally planting them somewhere where you're not going to be insecticiding them all the time for aphid control. Okay, so when we look at shrubs, and you know these lists are by no means comprehensive. There are there are great whole books on the topic, but um, we're trying to hit that intersection of, of useful landscape and great pollinator plants. And so these are some of my personal favorites, but there are a lot of other options out there. The shrubs broaden your palette a little bit. The trees are fairly limited in flower color and flower season. Um, the shrubs definitely have more going on in that regard. We do like to talk about the trees for their sheer volume of, of pollen resources. Some shrubs have that kind of volume of resources as well proportionate. Um, and in many cases, these, uh, these plants have a larger volume of flower per square foot than your typical flower garden because of their three-dimensional, they've got the extra, extra height. So um, the sheer volume of resources from trees and shrubs can be substantially larger than uh, anything except the largest plantings of perennials. Um, okay, question in the chat about the mock oranges, Philadelphus. Um, so Philadelphus is a good pollinator resource. Um, I had to cut this down. I could, do, I could talk like this for about three hours on pollinator plants with no problem. And I'm trying to keep this down to an hour. So I did cut a lot off of my preferred list. Philadelphus um, are excellent pollinator resources. Again, a lot of them have been bred for that double flower and that does reduce their pollinator attraction. Um, Philadelphus coronarius and Philadelphus ex virginalis are introduced varieties of, of mock orange uh, and they're quite widely used. They've gone down in popularity a little bit in the last, last decade or so, but they're still pretty widely used. We do have a native mock orange in Western Oregon, Philadelphus lewisii. And that one is an excellent pollinator resource. It's a bit bigger than most of the, uh, the commercial varieties. It uh, can be as large as, as 12 to 15 feet uh, and, and commensurately large flower cycle. One of the reasons Philadelphus came off the list, even though it was on my original list of pollinator shrubs, is because its bloom season really is right in a peak high resource time frame. So it was a little less critical to add those in, I think. For for, for the talk today. Also a question chat, or, chat, are any of these shrubs deer proof? Well, deer proof is a really a question begging term as anybody who's uh, lived in Northwest Corvallis knows. Um, even things that they we put on the deer resistant list doesn't mean that the fawns won't nibble them or when the deer get really hungry in high population areas um, that they, they, uh, they, they might resort to. Uh, broadly speaking, when we're looking at these, um, a lot of these are actually reasonably deer resistant. Um, Manzanita, uh, California lilac, ocean spray, Oregon grape, um, the flowering currants hit and miss, but except in the most heavy population areas tend to be pretty good. Spirea and chase tree both have uh, excellent deer resistance. So yes, deer resistance is on the list. It's part of that criteria of uh, making them easy to grow. Again, not a make or break, but it was considered, you know, at least on, on putting the list together. So manzanitas, uh, of course, there are Native manzanitas, several. Uh, not so much here in the valley. We got native manzanitas in the Cascades and native manzanitas on the coast and not much here in the valley for the most part. Manzanitas provide a very early bloom season um, and January, February, we see a lot of our, our, our late, uh, our, our, our year round hummingbirds on them. And or, uh, a lot of the honeybees when they're initially emerging will, will uh, forage on them. Bumblebees also forage extensively on manzanita. Manzanitas are good in a, from a landscape standpoint uh, also because um, they are evergreen shrubs with attractive bark. They're also sometimes a little bit finicky uh, getting into the right location, uh, needing usually full sun and reasonable drainage. Even though they're clay tolerant, they don't tolerate wet feet in the winter, which often limits their use here in Corvallis specifically, uh, unless you put them up on a mound or on a good side slope. So bees and hummers, but particularly bumblebees and, hu and hummingbirds, 
And uh, also uh, a number of uh, butterfly and moth species do use manzanita as a, as a larval food source. Uh, manzanita is the bigger manzanitas can get maybe as big as 10 or 12 feet. Um, there's a lot of smaller manzanitas down in that three to five foot range. And of course the common ground cover kinikinik is also a manzanita with all of its, um, with all of its uh, uh, spreading, spreading habit. Uh, in the chat, Caryopteris, I love Caryopteris too, um, and does provide a good uh, seasonal bloom um, and, and attraction. Caryopteris is not the easiest shrub in the world to grow in, in, in Corvallis, again, with our wet soils, um, but can be very effective. I got some great pictures of some of the native solitary bees um, on Caryopteris, especially some of the new pink flowered varieties. So an, another good choice uh, for a smaller shrub in particular. The Ceanothus, um, California lilacs, and their cousins like buckbrush. So some of them are native. The, a lot of the white flowered forms are native here. The blue flowered forms, um, the, the Ceanothus thursiflorus, the like variety Victoria is a good example of, of Ceanothus thursiflorus. Um, that species is native into Southern Oregon, not usually quite this far up. Um, most of them are pretty sizable shrubs on the medium to large range. Uh, Victoria is about 10 by 10 feet full grown, very fast growing. They typically bloom in peak season, uh, mid to late spring. A lot of them do a secondary bloom in the late summer, early fall as well, giving them a, a broader season of interest. They have um, reasonable nectar and lots of pollen. Many of them are also larval food resources. Ceanothus can be super fast growing shrubs. They're often first in on disturbed or rocky sites. Uh, Many Ceanothus do not live super, super long. You know, 15 years is kind of an average on a lot of the blue flowered evergreen forms. Uh, a fun plant with a real good potential to establish as a large shrub rapidly and provide a huge volume of, of resources for pollinators. Flowering quince can be a bit of a nuisance because of its tendency to spread. It's maintainable, but it, the roots do spread underground and sucker up. Um, Mostly moderate shrubs, though there are a tendency to be um, breeding them down a little bit to slightly smaller sizes. The, the, the old fashioned ones were really commonly six or seven feet and a lot of the newer varieties are down in that three to five foot size range. They provide an early bloom resource, again, ahead of most of the fruit trees. And that's kind of your criteria for early. If it's, if it's blooming earlier than your, than your apples and cherries, it's, it's early enough to matter to pollinators. Um, good nectaries, lots and lots of pollen. Besides the, as, a, as you might indicate by the shape of the flower there, the, the bee attraction, uh, hummingbirds visit it quite extensively for its nectary resource. Hummingbirds don't do a very good job of pollinating it. Uh, it's built wrong, but they do enjoy the, the, the free food. Summer sweet is an underutilized shrub uh, in Western Oregon. It's actually an Eastern US native. Uh, comes in a you know, white flowered and a pink flowered form. Um, they're surprisingly tough and adaptable shrubs. There are um, a number of varieties in that six to seven foot range and some new varieties in the three to four foot range. They have uh, sweetly scented flowers for all varieties and they're blooming in the mid to late summer in July and August into, into early September and for the latest ones. So uh, a very good volumetric uh, pollinator resource in a season when there's just not much else blooming uh, for them to feed on. We see a lot of bees and butterflies on them, and occasionally we see uh, butterflies on them uh, as, uh, as well, or hummingbirds on them as well. Um, hummers will feed on them, particularly pink flowered forms. Again, they're not built for hummingbird pollination, but they are a good food resource for hummingbirds. Another native ocean spray, one of my favorite native shrubs. Uh, it's a bigger shrub, sometimes reaching small, street, small tree stature, around 12 or 15 feet. Ocean spray is super adaptable. You see a lot of it growing wild in the foothills outside of Corvallis, uh, also in the Cascades. Um, it will take anything except really the wettest clay sites, uh, and it will take um, most degrees of shade and quite a bit of sun, though a combination of a really dry site with, with uh, really hot sun is pretty hard on them. They provide a good nectar resource and a good pollinator res pollen resource, and they are, again, in the early summer after the main spring bloom is passing. So a, a critical time period. They have, as you can see from the picture, lots and lots of, uh, of flowers on them. Flowers are pretty small. 
This means that they're visited much more by the native bees than they are by the honeybees. Uh, they're structured better for native bee foraging. So uh, great to encourage some of our native bee populations. Ocean spray is also a larval food resource for a number of butterflies. Oregon grape is an almost perfect wildlife plant um, because it's native. It's uh, adapted to a wide range of conditions. It has pollinator resource in the flowers. It has berries for birds. Uh, it's evergreen um, and super durable. So we have um, three major native species in Oregon, um, the tall Oregon grape, the cascades or longleaf and the, and the spread and the creeping Oregon grape. Uh, the longleaf and the creeping Oregon grape are both kind of colonial spreaders. They, they send root systems out and they spread out from there. So they don't just stay put. Um, the tall Oregon grape much less so. Um, Oregon grape is, is critical for our, some of our early bees and for our migratory hummingbirds. This is one of the key food sources that they're coming back to find. Besides our native Oregon grapes, you can expand the uh, pollinator horizon with Oregon grape by, in, by using some of the uh, specialty varieties from uh, particularly from Asia. There are fall blooming and even midwinter blooming Mahonias, uh, particularly like Mahonia uh, winter um, Winter Sun or Mahonia Charity are nice big eight or nine foot evergreen shrubs with yellow flowers in December that smell like um, roses. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, huge pollinator resource for our winter hummers. People don't think of Virginia creeper and its cousins as having anything significant in the way of flowers. They have uh, little tiny, tiny flowers. And the flowers are pretty well concealed back under the foliage. So this is um, Boston Ivy, Virginia Creeper, or even Ampelopsis, the uh, porcelain berries. Um, you will, if you got a fairly extensive planting of, of, uh, of a Boston Ivy or Virginia Creeper on a wall, you'll, you'll notice in the, in the summer, in the, particularly in the early summer, that there's bees all around it, but you don't see or smell any flowers. The flowers are there, the bees know they're there. Um, they're just pretty well hidden. Um, we do get bees on them, solitary bees, native bees, particularly less so than honeybees, but we see honeybees on them as well. They're also attractive to some of the more obscure uh, pollinators. Um, as you see in the picture there, our native thread-waisted wasp, uh, a fun little wasp that pollinates uh, secondarily. They're not like, really high efficiency pollinators, but the adult stage is a nectar feeder, as you can see, and they do transfer some pollen. Um, they're parasitic upon spiders for some species or on caterpillars for the others. Um, so they're kind of a fun life cycle plant bug like that. They're really attractive insects, very unusual with a kind of, uh, our typical one out here is this kind of mahogany colored, um, very long wasp and very peaceful. So they're not a threat. Um, obscure pollinators, small bees and off season is what makes, and then just the sheer volume of flowers on a bank of Virginia creeper or Boston ivy is, is quite tremendous. Another native shrub, nine bark. Uh, of course, there are native ones here, and there are also East Coast natives, and all of them are, are uh, well, what are pollinator beneficial. Another excellent broad wildlife uh, plant um, has a lot of nectar and some, but not tons of pollen in the mid to late spring, so kind of the tail end of the main flowering season. Um, Besides the, the pollinator aspect, they are the, the dry seed capsules uh, late, in the, late in the summer and going into fall are excellent bird resources. Um, a lot of birds use them also as just a shelter species. They're a very dense shrub and they can hide in them and nest in them very well. Uh, our native nine bark is also a excellent larval host for, for many moths and butterflies. So a, a good, a broad host again. Okay, one of the quote unquote, perfect pollinator plants, red flowering currant. So uh, red flowering currant is a native shrub uh, with a tremendous volume of flowers that are extremely attractive to both bees and hummingbirds. Uh, we see a lot of hummingbirds on them. Uh, red flowering currant is one of those plants that is, that is vying, constantly vying for the, for the record of the most diversity of pollinators visiting it during its bloom period. Um, it is very attractive to a very wide range of pollinators. Uh, it's also a larval host plant. Um, so the currants as a group are a lot of fun. Of course, the red flowering currant is one of the most ornamental and being, being local native is, is a critical resource. There are other later flowering currants that are yellow flowered currants. They're also great pollinator resource plants. Uh, 
if you spread out a little bit and do a little hunting, you can also get uh, Ribes malvaceum. Um, it's called a um, mallow currant. It's native to the Sierras and it blooms, it's semi evergreen and it blooms about a month ahead of the red flowering current. So uh, even earlier resource for, for our returning hummers as well as our overwintering hummers. Just very attractive plants, very showy in the landscape and excellent pollinator habitat. Spirea. So spirea, again, uh, attracts a, a very wide range of pollinators, pollinating flies, uh, bees, some hummers, lots of butterflies. There's a, quite a variety of spireas. We have um, a local native uh, is, is the western spirea, uh, spirea douglasii, and it's a big plant. It's one you see in the picture there. Uh, it can be eight or nine feet tall at, at max. Um, big spikes of, of flowers in the summer and over a, quite a long bloom season. Um, we also see, though not typically locally native, but like on the coast, uh, a, a lower form, Spirea densiflora. densiflora. Uh, and it's kind of a shorter stock ear shrub with cap of flower, a flat cap of flowers rather than the big spike. Then there's a whole batch of introduced species from Asia that bloom at different times yet, including some that fairly uh, effectively repeat bloom through most of the summer. So all of them are, are good pollinator resources. Um, our native one is a favorite of mine because it's one of those plants that is massive in, in, in show and flower, and it will grow in a, in a site that is literally flooded slightly underwater in the winter and dry enough to break out into big cracks in the summer it's a spirea that will tolerate, it's a plant that will tolerate uh, that tough of a condition. So that's uh, Spirea douglasii. Chased tree, Vitex agnus casis and, and a couple of other cousins in the Vitex family are very large shrubs with uh, a huge volume of resources in the late summer again, a, a strong dearth period when there's not much else flowering. Blue flowers are attractive to bees and to butterflies. Um, and it provides both nectar and, and pollen for the bees. Um, the sheer volume of flowers available, the long bloom season and the off-season off bloom, the late summer bloom, are why that one makes my list as, as a top pollinator plant. Most of them are substantial, um, can be 15 or 20 feet on, on Vitex agnus castus. Um, they've been breeding smaller forms. You can get a lot of uh, chase trees now in that four to six to maybe seven foot range, which makes them a lot more manageable for most landscapes. Okay, so perennials. Lots and lots of perennials to go through. We're going to hit them kind of briefly. Um, perennials typically have specific seasons of bloom. Many of the perennials bloom for longer seasons than most shrubs or trees, but not all summer. The all summer bloom is typically a, the, the, the uh, category of annuals. Uh, but long bloom, six, eight, ten weeks on a lot of these is not at all un uncommon. Um, and they, they provide a great diversity of pollinator habitat and a great diversity of bloom times. Yarrow uh, is, is a surprisingly good resource. Uh, it's a summer and into fall, a very long bloom season, maybe as much as 12 weeks. It has some nectar. It's a great pollen resource. You can tell when your beehives are, are on the yarrow because the kind of grayish pollen in their pollen baskets is, is different from the usual color you see them bringing in. Yarrow is also an excellent larval host plant. Most of the yarrows you see in the catalogs and in the nurseries, um, all the different colors of yarrow, the, the bright yellows and the bright purples and pinks and all those, um, are hybrids or introduced species, but we do have native yarrow as well. Our native yarrow is what you see in the picture there is typically a white flower, though there is some color variation even within the, the native uh, group. Agastache, the hyssops. Um, there's a whole batch of different varieties and, uh, and colors. Um, some of them are more, they're all spiky. Some of them are dense spikes like the blue one you see there. Others are more open looking, more like a, more like a, um, like a sage flower than, than like a mint flower. Um, they attract a tremendously large diversity of pollinators. They bloom from about July through frost. They are primarily nectary resources, but there is some pollen available. And we see flies and bees and butterflies and hummingbirds all on the hyssop all through the blooming season. So a good diversity of attraction. Um, the hyssops, the agastaches, range in size. Most of them are in that 18 inch or so height range, a few of them are a bit taller. The alliums, uh, of course, 
edible alliums, uh, garlic and onions, we seldom let them flower, encourage them to flower, though chives flower quite widely. That's what you see in the picture there is chives. Um, there are a batch of ornamental alliums. We have a whole batch of native species of allium as well. Um, not too many local, local natives, more if you start talking about Western Oregon as a whole. Um, different varieties have different bloom times. The vast majority of them are early summer to midsummer bloomers. So they do have um, a, a good off, being off the main season uh, window there. Um, they attract a wide variety of pollinators as well. They are perfectly structured for butterfly pollination, and we see tons and tons of butterflies on them. But bees, both solitary and, and honeybees, do make uh, extensive use of them as well, as you can see in the picture. So good long bloom season, especially if you mix up some different varieties, uh, wide diversity of pollinators, and both nectary and pollen resource, making them excellent plants. Alliums are um, pretty much all bulbs, and as that implies, um, the vast majority of them have growing seasons and flower, and then they're dormant for parts of the season, including parts you wouldn't expect. So a lot of alliums are summer dormant in the late summer, blooming in the late spring through early summer, and then going dormant as it gets hot and dry, a typical bulb strategy. Okay, milkweed, everybody knows for its monarch attraction. In, in, in truth, there's a batch of different milkweeds um, and different populations of monarchs prefer slightly different milkweeds. We have two that make it as Oregon natives. Um, and the one you see there, it's Asclepius speciosa, showing milkweed is the dominant one in our immediate area. There's a, a redder flowered narrow leafed milkweed, Vesicularis, uh, that we see in California and Southern Oregon pretty extensively. The Asclepius tuberosa that everybody gets so excited about in the magazines and catalogs is really a Midwestern plant. And so monarch populations are slightly different. We have the population that, that winters in Mexico and moves up to the Midwest, really likes Asclepius tuberosa and those other orange flower like Chrysaphica. Um, our population tends to winter in more, more in California and, and northern parts of Mexico and not as far south, uh, and then comes up the coastline. Um, that's what the one we see here in the valley, and they definitely prefer Speciosa, uh, our, our local native, our pink flowered one you see there. Um, great nectary, so lots of other pollinators besides the butterflies will forage on them uh, for, for nectary. There's some pollen available for bees as well. The bloom season is fairly long in the mid to later part of summer. And um, they are, of course, a critical larval resource for monarchs. A few other butterflies will also use them, but monarch is the dominant user of that. Um, so excellent plant for pollinators. Uh, milkweeds are worth um, the caveat that they don't stay put. They can spread and become thuggy if they find a good location. And if they're not in a lo good location, they'll sometimes just kind of wither and fade out over, over the years. So it's often a choice of poorly performing milkweed or milkweed that's doing way too well for the site. They generally prefer um, some moisture during the early parts of the season, but drying down more during the late parts of the season. The asters, and we could talk about composites as a whole all day, but the asters and their, and their allies are a major group of later blooming composites. Um, they're that, that uh, symmetrical, that radial symmetrical flower shape. Um, and we get a lot of different pollinators on them, but primarily bees and butterflies and uh, quite actually quite a few of uh, the hoverflies and other, uh, and other fly pollinators. Asters all have a fairly long bloom cycle and they're typically um, midsummer or later in bloom cycle, some of them summer into fall, providing lots of nectar, lots of pollen, and again, major larval resource for a number of, of butterflies. Now, most asters are not native. Most asters are introduced species from elsewhere, but we do have some. Um, and Siphia trichon um, are our native asters, uh, Hall's aster and, uh, and Oregon aster. Um, that's what you see down there in that bottom picture is one of our native asters just at the end of its bloom season in October and beginning to set lots of seed. Camas, native bulb. Although it blooms in the main sequence, it's such a, a valuable resource plant being native and as, an, as a native bulb. Um, and for vo volumetrics, it actually uh, establishes fairly substantial colonies over time. So it kind of spreads itself around. Um, good pollen resource, good nectar resource, and a fairly easy plant to grow in any location that's kind of damp to wet, at least seasonally. Um, one of those great plants to put in those sites that are too wet to grow more traditional bulbs. And, uh, and early, um, basically, a, basically a, a early summer bloom, late, late spring, early summer. Uh, 
a couple of different species than native here, and both of them do quite well in our area. The coneflowers. Everybody knows coneflower as a pollinator resource as well as a cold remedy. Um, they are very well structured for butterfly pollination, but they are also majorly foraged on and pollinated by bees. Uh, again, that, that, that multiple nectary in a single flower is, is, is good for both. We do see hummingbirds on them as well. Again, the hummingbirds don't pollinate them very well, but, are, uh, but do feed on them pretty extensively. Very long bloom seasons over the course of the summer, the earliest being maybe late June and going forward from there. Uh, we say coneflowers and cousins because black-eyed Susan is also in that group. Gaylardia is also in that group. They're all very closely related. They all share these, uh, these, these pollinator value. We don't have any native coneflowers in Western Oregon. There are some in Eastern Oregon, um, but we do have some native uh, Gaylardia, some native blanket flowers that are very, very close cousins. And that was uh, the picture, if you go back to, the, to that introductory slide on, on flower shapes, that was the, the, the flower picture on the top. Hellebores. Um, different hellebores have different bloom times. There's a fairly diverse group. Some of them are fully evergreen, some are partially evergreen, some are fully deciduous. They're all pretty much um, shade or partial shade plants. Um, our real focus for, with hellebores from a, from a pollinator standpoint is particularly the earlier blooming ones, um, which are finishing bloom right now in March. Um, so they provide a little bit of nectar, but they provide a good pollen resource in that very early season when the other pollen resources are very few and far between that match up with some of the, some of the earliest blooming of the quince and the tail end of the, of the hazelnut bloom cycle. So pollen resource for bees particularly on hellebore. Lupins, lots and lots of different types of lupin, both introduced ornamentals and several native species. Uh, strong showy uh, ornamentals, um, then they feed bees and they feed hummingbirds. They are also very extensive uh, larval host plants for many, many different species of, of butterfly and moth. We have several native species. Our natives typically are this blue color, as you see here. Um, our natives have sometimes been used in hybridizing some of the introduced varieties as well, but our natives don't exhibit the wide degree of flower color variation that uh, the, the, the hybrids and introduced forms do. Um, but excellent showy ornamentals, fairly easy to grow, and great resources. Okay, we talked about the flower and currant being a multi-pollinator habitat plant. So is false Solomon seal. Um, so Simulacima, if you have the old books, or they regrouped them into Myanthemum, if you, if you follow the newer books, it's a slowly spreading or, or, or thicket forming tall perennial, about two to three feet tall, with a bloom period that's pretty extensive uh, in the early to mid summer. And uh, just a tremendous array of pollinators. This is where you see a lot of pollinating beetle, uh, pollen feeding beetles on it, pollen feeding flies on it, as well as uh, a variety of bees on it. Um, so excellent plant for a woodsier site uh, to encourage pollinator habitat. So the mallow family offers a tremendous array of, of, of different pollinators. Of course, the hollyhocks you're, you're familiar with as ornamentals. We have several natives as well. Uh, the checker mallows or checker blooms, uh, sedalsias, a um, couple of species here in the valley and more when you start spreading it uh, statewide. So they're all typically fairly tall, showy ornamentals. Um, late spring to early summer, particularly uh, of interest for, for, for local native uh, plant growers is the um, Sidalsia campestris. It's kind of a paler pink to almost white blooming form. And I've seen them blooming into July in, in the valley. So well past the peak of major flower availability for pollinators. Uh, it's a nectar resource primarily for hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, and the bees will get some nectar out of it as well. Um, bees will feed on the pollen as well. There's not as much pollen on some, uh, and there's some variation in there. Um, some of them are, are better pollen sources than the others in the family as a whole. The entire family are major larval host plants for butterflies as well. So excellent for building up that population. Monarda, bee balm, um, nectar uh, resource. Hummingbird, this, hummingbirds are all over these. So you look at that flower structure and you can see why that obscure deeply recessed uh, nectary with the pollen points sticking out above the top of the petals. Um, so excellent for pollination by a hummingbird and a major hummingbird plant. 
bees make extensive use uh, of it as well. And there's both nectar and pollen readily available for bees, particularly for longer tongued bees, because uh, like our bumbles break into a couple group groups of long tongued and short tongued. And also for bees uh, which learn to eat through the petal and feed at the tree underneath without bypassing the pollen entirely. Uh, Monardas bloom for a long time and it's all through the summer cycle. So again, um, definitely an off season uh, food resource, lots of available resource out of a plant. Cat mint and catnip, and there's several other kind of similar plants in that group. Very tough and adaptable plants that sometimes do a little too well, blooming for a very long time through most of the summer. The blue color and that kind of open, open faced bilaterally symmetrical flower uh, shows that they are primarily bee pollinated and they are a bee favorite. Uh, a planting of catnip will be a buzz with bees most of the summer. Um, nectary resource primarily, uh, there is some pollen, but not much. It is really dominantly a, a nectar plant. The penstemons bloom for again a very long period of time in the summer. A deeply recessed tubular plant you would think immediately hummingbirds and hummingbirds do use them but it's actually built for bee pollination. The, the pollen parts are farther back into the tube. One of the ways you can kind of read that in the flower is all those uh, markings on the inside of that tube are guide marks to draw the bees back especially in UV they really really pop out and they draw the bees back to find the nectary and thus going up, brushing up against the, the, the pollen parts. Um, many sorts of bees use them. We have native bees that specialize in our native penstemons and uh, are part of their reproductive strategy where the uh, male bees will camp out as the penstemons are coming into flower when the female bees of that species um, come out and find that flower. The male bees will actually capture them and trap them in the tube of the flower for mating and then let them go and, and continuing that process on and on. So we have special specialist bees that make use of, of uh, penstemon specifically. The sage family, a big family, uh, and actually almost everything in those traditional Mediterranean herbs, thymes, sages, um, tucrium, germander, um, all of those are major pollinator plants. Um, the sage group in particular, the ornamental salvias rather than the culinary ones, typically bloom in a critical period for a very long period of time. They bloom in July through August and September, um, and a very extensive bloom period. Bees are the dominant uh, pollinator on, on sage family, and you'll see constant bee populations on them during the, during the season. But hummingbirds will also feed on them pretty extensively. So when we're looking at um, establishing a pollinator habitat, I'm gonna take just a few minutes to go over that and then I'll just open up to questions. Um, think about the available space and space you're willing to dedicate specifically to pollinator habitat. Consider placing a couple of trees if you can, if the space will allow, because there are no other pollinator plants that can provide the sheer volume of resources that a tree can for pollinators. Um, once you've got a tree or two placed, uh, you can accent it with some larger and then graduated to smaller shrubs. Putting solitary shrubs in is okay. Putting groupings of three to five shrubs in, if space allows, gives you more density of, uh, of flower population. This is important for drawing pollinators in. Uh, this is particularly important for, uh, for long range pollinators, uh, pollinators such as, uh, as honeybees and butterflies. Uh, butterflies are particularly valuable to have larger masses of flowers for. Butterflies fly in these kind of erratic flight patterns over very long distances and they, they are color oriented foragers. So if you see a couple of flowers in their color range, they might visit or they might not, but if they see a large patch of flowers in their color range, they will tend to, uh, to find that more readily. Um, once you've got your, uh, your, your key anchor pieces, your trees and, sh and shrubs in place, is when you'll then group volumes of smaller plants around. Depending on the amount of space, you can spread that out to, to many different species, or you can keep it fairly concentrated. As I mentioned, concentrated color does matter for a lot of foragers. Um, make sure when you're selecting that you are trying to select intentionally for a broad range of flower times as well as flower shapes, as that is critical for attracting different types of pollinator. Um, in both perennials and shrubs, you have some 
evergreen options and throwing some evergreen into the mix is definitely uh, valuable from the overall aesthetic concept of, uh, of balancing out your landscape and having some winter interest, even if you're not incorporating a ton of winter bloomers. Um, annuals can be pocketed around that. Annuals, of course, take more input because you have to replace them every year, but are still incredibly valuable. A lot of annuals are excellent pollinator plants. Um, there are annual milkweeds, for example, um, and things like Alyssum draw, draw a completely different group of, of, of small pollinators in. While you're putting in plantings for pollinators, keep in mind some of the other pollinator needs, such as water resources. Um, of course, hummingbirds like running water where, that, where that's practical. Um, bird baths for, for water resource for your, for your feathered friends are fine for, for water resource for most other pollinators, but if you're using anything with any depth at all to it, make sure you put some rocks in your bird bath or other platforms in your bird bath that extend above the water line because it's really easy for bees to get trapped in the water surface tension and drown. If they have something uh, like a shallow rock that they can then crawl out of the water on, uh, it, will it will improve your bee survival rates. Certain solitary bees need specific nesting materials like mason bees need access to open clay mud. Uh, leaf cutter bees need plants that have kind of thin leaves like, um, like aspens or fruit trees or roses. Uh, so other nesting materials um, like that can be beneficial for encouraging a diverse pollinator habitat. So that's the formal part of the presentation I had for you today. And I would beyond that, just open up to any questions you have. You can type them in chat or you can unmute and ask them verbally. All right. So question in chat, regarding protecting larval habitat, is the time of year I should not be pruning and cleaning your plants? Uh, last month I was pruning up some lupin and I noticed a few green caterpillars on the leaves. Yeah. Um, it gets hard when you're talking about diverse habitat. Um, I would just start off by saying the entire Better Homes and Gardens manicured uh, landscape look is really not great pollinator habitat. Some pollinators need hollow dead stems of plants to nest in. Um, others, as you mentioned, a larval food source. So um, most cases, um, you can do a fair amount of cleanup in the winter on most plants. Um, your caterpillars out this early is is kind of a, is kind of exciting. And uh, are are you local, Patrick, or are you out of area? Well, with yeah, okay. So you're on the very some of the earliest caterpillars you'll you'll actually see in, in March. Um, from basic so larval feeding from caterpillars goes from roughly now through maybe mid to at the very end of the cycle, late summer, but mostly through midsummer, they have to go through an adult stage and egg laying again. Um, different species have different specific periods of time for forage. Um, your solitary bees, similarly, they'll be nesting, uh, as I mentioned at, the, at one point there, uh, uh, they'll be in nest a lot of the, a lot of the year. So um, going for an intensive manicured lot is, is not ideal for pollinator habitat. Even if you want the rest of your landscape to look really tidy and structured and formal, consider dedicating some space to a natural and unmanicured look and you'll have better overall habitat available. Okay, for pollinating plants, uh, any good for a shady area in partial sun? Let's say Kirkland, Washington. Um, yeah, Solomon Seal immediately comes to mind. A lot of the maples will tolerate some some shade, but uh, but again, if you've got that much shade, you may not have space for tree material. Several of the Oregon grapes are excellent uh, shade plants. Uh, Ocean Spray is an excellent shade plant. Um, a, a, a quick run through of, of some of the better shade or partial shade plants. Um, things I didn't necessarily hit on today, winter blooming camellias, uh, providing hummingbird access in, for, the, for our resident winter hum, hummingbirds. Uh, they make great shade plants. Um, the Asian Mahonias for winter bloom as well uh, are, all, are all shade plants. Uh, so a fair, array, a fair amount of them can be. One of the things about diverse pollinator habitat is um, there's not a lot of shade bees. So we start looking at minor pollinators uh, in particular. Uh, and so things that have wide diversity of pollinator habitat and uh, that attract some flies and beetles often get more attention in the shade. <laughs> 
All right. Any messages? All right. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate the, the participation and uh, glad we could get things going for you here. Have a good day.